Exodus 24. Okay, we're under four, uh, seven steps to learn the Bible. Seven steps to learn the Scriptures. And uh, we're on step number four. Step one is to believe God. Step two is to pray to the God to explain the Bible. Step three is to uh, read the Bible itself. Step four is study it. Study the words. Under study, we've gone through comparison context and now we're still under contrast and this is the main thrust of contrast okay under contrast uh, today specifically today uh, we're looking at doctrine looking at the Bible from a doctrinal viewpoint okay so that's that's make sure we get that today okay so let's pray Lord thank you for your words. And Lord, this book is given for doctrine. I pray that you'd help us to understand it. Help us realize your mindset of the Bible. The most important doctrine is the second coming of your Son. To glorify Him. And we get caught away with ourselves and try to make the Bible fit in our little system. Help us to follow your words and rightly divide them properly. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, under contrast... Under contrast, when you read through the Bible, you ask yourself two questions on a regular basis. And the questions are, who's talking and to whom is he talking? Okay, because the Bible, this Bible is written to three groups of people. Jews, Gentiles, and the Church of God. Now, when I say the Church of God, we'll use the word Christian. And Christians will be from Calvary until the rapture. Okay, so, of course, the time period I'm using here uh, is uh, based on our calendar. And our calendar is, could, is most likely off because we're already after 2000. The Jewish calendar says we're at 5767. So, if we're going to go with exactly 6,000 years, this is very discouraging. 233 years to go. I certainly hope theirs is off. I already know ours is off. Okay, and so you ask yourself uh, the question, who's talking to whom is he talking? Then you ask yourself, is it dealing with the first coming or second coming? Because in the Bible, he will jump 2,000 years at a comma, colon, or conjunction. Okay, then we look to see the differences between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Remember that the Old Testament... Primarily is kingdom of heaven. New Testament is primarily kingdom of God. We do have the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament, but that's something they fight over, and that's uh, been uh, under the devil's control, and so he delegates to whoever worships him most. At the time of Adam, both of them was available, but because Adam sinned, the kingdom of God fluttered away, and the kingdom of heaven was passed to, to whoever. And then the kingdom of God came as a result of Calvary. The kingdom of God's within us. Okay, and so uh, that's that kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Then we ask ourselves the question about Old Testament, New Testament. Obviously, there are differences. Then I went through the definition for last days. Last days refer to the seven-year tribulation as well the words the end as well the word Selah. Okay, so that's also clues for our time period. Okay, in your Bible, when you read in Genesis chapter 2, you find a tree of life. Ain't much of a tree, but there you got a tree. If you didn't know what that was, that is supposed to be a tree. Okay, you have a tree of life at the beginning of time. And in Revelation 22, we have a tree of life showing up again. Why? It's because God's original plan was for Adam and Eve to live perfect lives, populate the earth, eventually populate the planets, get eternal life from this tree. Okay, since they botched that, remember what he did with the cherub? He put the cherub around the tree of life so they couldn't go back and eat of it and get eternal life. Okay, and so then the tree of life shows up in Revelation 22. He's going to start it all over again. So that's how that Bible works. That's how it's laid out. 
Okay, now we're going to look at the uh, doctrine today. Last week I gave the differences between doctrine and devotion or spiritual application or instruction. Under doctrine, we're going to look at seven sets of seven in the Bible. Seven is a prominent number in the Bible, and it is a prominent number in our lives also, seven days in a week. Okay, you get seven holes in your head. Okay, and a bunch of other things. Okay, so seven is quite prominent. The piano has seven keys, and the next one is the octave up. Seven whole keys. Okay, so you have seven is quite prominent. If you have the three primary colors, three secondary colors, and black, you can paint any picture you want. Seven is quite prominent. I'm going to give you seven sets of seven. In the Bible, you have seven covenants in the Bible, seven baptisms, seven mysteries, seven dispensations. Okay, dispensational about personal salvation. Seven different time periods for that. Seven judgments, seven topics you and I are not to ignore, and then there are seven Gospels in the Bible. So we're going to try to run them. I'm not going to go in detail on these sevens because I have uh, probably preached on each of these specifically. So this is just kind of a, a review. Okay, but if you're in Exodus 24, notice the Bible is a book of covenant. So we're going to run the seven covenants first. Exodus 24, verse 7. A covenant is another word for contract. Okay, we make agreements every day of our lives. Okay, almost every day unless you're a hermit, but then I guess you can still agree with yourself. Okay, but contracts. Anybody who reads the Bible sees two basic contracts or covenants or testaments. Old Testament, New Testament. Okay, now, some of you probably read, uh, I'm sure a few of you read there, they break up the Bible according to time periods where they have an age of a uh, conscience, patriarchs, the law, grace, and I don't remember the others. I innocence. Okay, some of you remember that. Okay, that's how Mr. Schofield divides the Bible. That's how Mr. Larkin leans that way. I think that's a good starter, but it's got its flaws. If you run the covenants, it's the best way. Okay, Exodus 24, verse 6. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book, notice, the book of the covenant, and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient and Moses took the book and sprinkled it on, or the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So here we have an example in the Old Testament about the law, a book of a covenant. It's like a contract. If you would, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26. Just as in the olden days, today you can't trust a man's word or handshake. But it used to be in a day in America that virtually anybody could trust a man's word by what he said. When he says something, he means it. Well, God is still that way. And some people who honor God and the word of God is still that way. But that's few and far between. Deuteronomy 31, verse 26. Take this book of the law and put it in the sight of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against thee. Now that book right there, most likely that specific one or one like it, was found in 2 Kings 23 verse 21 when a young fellow was a king by the name of Josiah. 2 Kings 23, verse 21. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. Okay, so we have seven covenants in the Bible. Let's see if we can run these things. Okay, the very first covenant is in the Garden of Eden. This covenant we'll call the Edenic Covenant, or, or just Eden. What was that covenant with Adam? Basically, very simple. You eat that, you're a dead man. That's, that's kind of a good contract. Okay? And so, Adam breached the contract, and he died. 
So that one's done. That one's done. Right after that one, he had another covenant. The Adamic covenant. That is laid out in Genesis chapter 3. The covenant he made with Adam after he fell, the covenant was, okay, you men, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. In other words, you're going to sweat it out to try to make a living. And ladies, you're going to give birth under sorrow. Now, it doesn't say pain, even though that is there. Uh, and maybe science will figure out how to do it without pain. I don't think so. But it does say sorrow. They're not going to figure out how to do it without sorrow, meaning your emotions levels up and down and everything. Okay, and then the wife... Uh, you know, it's going to have a make have a desire to her husband, and in other words, to control him or whatnot. Okay, and so those are the Adamic covenant. Okay, that's the second one. We are still under that covenant that has not been changed. You know, last time I think ladies it's still sorrowful and painful to have children. Okay, and last time, yeah, you're going to be sweating it out to try to make a living. Okay, people say, well, we got air conditioners now. Yeah, and that's why we got cancer too. It's good to sweat. It's good to get that stink out. Okay, keep the plumbing going. Okay, so you got Adam. Okay, about 15 or 1700 years go by. And uh, God told a guy named Noah, he said, you better start building a boat because uh, rain's coming down. And you better tell those people that uh, they better not miss this boat. So he told them for 120 years, don't miss the boat. But you see, they didn't have the sense to come out of the rain. So we have another covenant now at this time. A covenant with Noah. You'll find that at the end of Genesis 9. And this is a covenant technically about the different races. Where Shem was given spiritual blessings. Japheth was given material blessings. And Ham or Canaan, his son Canaan, was given to be a servant. Not all of Ham's children, just Canaan in particular. Okay, and so those are your three basic races. This Noahic covenant is still in effect. This is when they start eating meat. This is where, uh, um, yeah, they were okay to eat meat with that. And uh, so these things are still in effect. Japheth would be the material blessings. That's the white race. Japheth would be the one who enlarged himself. So if you look at World Book Encyclopedia, look under the word Explorer, you will find that 99% of the men who explored places in the world were from Japheth. 99%. The list that last time I checked in World Book Encyclopedia, they had one other one that was a Jew. All the rest were Japheth. Now, you ain't going to figure that out. That's God. Okay? That's the white race going out discovering things. So, you have Edom, Adam, Noah. Okay, then you got Adam, or Abraham shows up about 1990 B.C. So, right around in here. So, you have Abram. Okay, Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant. This covenant was dealing with a piece of dirt. This covenant was agreed to Abraham when he was sleeping. This covenant is still in effect today. This is a covenant that causes the Middle East uh, arguments today. Okay, the, the Ishmaelites say, no, it goes to Ishmael. And a Jew says, no, it belongs to Isaac. Okay, and it went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. New Testament and Old Testament, that is still in force. No, the Abrahamic land grant has not been forfeited and given to the church. That's what the Catholic Church has tried to say for years, and that's what British Israelites are trying to say today. No, that is an unconditional covenant that goes to Abraham. It is an everlasting covenant, according to Psalms 105, verse 9 and through 11. Okay, then you have... About 15 or 1450 BC, so up in here, you have a covenant with a fellow named Moses. Now, technically, it's with the nation of Israel. This is the first one. In uh, the seven uh, stages that are used by Larkin and Schofield and many others, this would be called the age of the law. Okay, now this is one 
you can limit into a time period. This is a national agreement with the nation of Israel. Okay, that's a national covenant. Now, that one had conditions to it. The conditions are laid out in Deuteronomy. Where? When a nation of Israel obeyed God, God would bless them. If they did not obey them, God, then God would curse them. And, of course, that's why the Jews are blinded today. Because they have violated this agreement. Okay, that's the one that we just read about in Exodus 24. That is a national and a conditional covenant. Okay, Deuteronomy 29, I got written here. Deuteronomy 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. Okay, so this one is commonly uh, referred to as the law. Okay, hopefully you can see that law in the back. Okay, under that covenant, about 400 years later, maybe a little more than that, about 400 to 500 years later, the second king of Israel shows up and he gets a, an agreement. This is called the Davidic covenant. That covenant is uh, laid out in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That agreement basically says that the king of Israel someday will come from the tribe of Judah and he will sit on the throne of David and that king will be Jesus Christ. And when he rules at this time, that will be the millennium. And he treats David like a son. David is in type a born-again believer, but he is not a born-again believer. Okay, so that's the Davidic covenant. That one is unconditional. There are three of them, three of them that belong to the nation of Israel. Unconditional, conditional, unconditional. All three of those belong with the nation of Israel. Now, what the Lord is going to do is He's going to take all those and put them in a new covenant. If you would, look in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. A brand new covenant. Okay? New covenant. Some call this uh, the Palestinian covenant. A true Palestine is a Jew. The news media tries to make a Palestinian, you know, one of the Arabs. But a true Palestinian is a Jew. Okay, this is a new covenant. You'll see in Exodus, uh, Hebrews 8, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Now, when you read down through there, you'll see that during this time period, you read the words. Okay, the Hebrews 8 is a New, is a new Testament translation of the original one found in Jeremiah 31, 31, and 34. They're almost virtually identical. Okay, Hebrews 8, verse 8. Uh, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, what covenant is that? Pop quiz time, wake up. What covenant is that one? That's Moses. Okay, that's Moses. Okay, and then he says, uh, When I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will, future tense, make with the house of Israel after those days. What days? After those days. What days? Usually when you find something like that, after those days, after the last days. Okay? After those days, because we already read, if you remember Hebrews 1 verse 2, He has spoken to us by His Son in these last days. So after those days, these last days over here in the tribulation, He said, I'm going to make a brand new covenant with them. Right there it is. Hebrews 8 verse 10. Uh, Say the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not... Teach everyone his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. When is there a time period everyone knows about Jesus Christ? Back in here? They didn't even know about Him. Over here in the church age, you say, Yeah, we know about Him, but do you think they know about Jesus Christ in China? Or India? 
There's got to be a time period in history where everybody on the planet knows Jesus Christ. Our clue is the millennium. He's the king. That's the new covenant. See how this Bible fits together if we just let the words say what they mean? Doctrine. This is a blessed book. This promise, if you go back to Romans 11, this is the promise He gave to Israel. Romans 11, verse 25, you'll see where Israel is blinded. Romans 11, 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant. This right here is one of the seven topics you are not to ignore. It also happens to be one of the seven mysteries. This is doubly important to know this. Now, you should not be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness and part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What time period is that? Well, let's see. Was Israel blind back here in Moses' day? No. Was in David's day? No. They were blind in here a little bit. They were blind in here. During the church age, well, that's where the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Boy, that's got to be their blindness. I got a newsletter from Sidney White. He's a fellow uh, in, in uh, Israel. And Sidney wrote his newsletter, Please pray for us. Uh, I personally have been uh, threatened by a mafia. And my son, Hysam, now Joab, they changed his name from Hysam to Joab, which is very wise. <laughs> okay, and David, all three of them have been threatened by a mafia guy who said, I can take you out and squish you as fast as anything, just when I say the word. Hasn't threatened Ida, but he's threatened these three, so they moved Joab and um, David out of the country. That's Israel. That's Israel. That'd be a tough place to serve, wouldn't it? Okay, so Romans 11.25, So all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there should come out of Zion the deliverer shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That's the new covenant. This was written about Jeremiah 31.31-34, 31, 31 Jeremiah 50, verse 20. It's part of Daniel 70 weeks. One of the seven characteristics of the end of Daniel 70 weeks. So there's a lot laid on this covenant. Okay, so there's the covenant. So we got those laid out. Now let's run the seven baptisms real quick. Okay, again, I'm not going in quite detail on these things because a lot of us have gone through these. But to put them in our chart here. Okay, the seven baptisms. If you would look in Ephesians 4 verse 5. Seven baptisms. Ephesians 4, 5 says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So when I tell you there's seven baptisms, you know, a lot of times people get all messed up on that. Okay, so Ephesians says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but I'm telling you there are seven baptisms in the Bible. Okay, now if you go to Hebrews 6, verse 2, it will mention the first phrase, the doctrine of baptisms, plural. There are seven baptisms in the Bible, but there's one real baptism uh, for a New Testament believer that will warrant your ticket to heaven. And it's got nothing to do with water. That's, that's something for a Baptist to say. <laughs> okay. So, let's run the seven baptisms real quick. First one, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2. Okay, this will be right about in here. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2. This says the baptism unto Moses. The baptism unto Moses, how they walked through the, through the sea and they were baptized in the cloud and the, and the pillar and all that stuff. Okay, that's the baptism unto Moses. The key on this one is they walked through the Red Sea without touching the water. So there, there's that one years ago. Baptism unto Moses. They didn't even know anything about the baptism under Moses when they got baptized under Moses. First time this was brought up is in 1 Corinthians 10. The next one chronologically. Okay, we'll run these chronologically. John the Baptist shows up right in here. Okay, John. Some call him John the Baptizer. I was in Colorado one time and went to this guy's church, you know, and 
he, had a, he was packing a pistol on the side as he's teaching the Bible. And I thought, wait, well, hey, that ain't too bad. He was, a, he was a county sheriff. He was a pastor of the church. It was a Bible church. And he kept saying, John the Baptizer, John the Baptizer. He didn't want to believe the book said. He wanted to mess around with the book. You know, but even at that. So we have John the Baptist. Okay? Uh, Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse uh, 11 you have three baptisms mentioned in one verse. He says, John indeed baptized with water, but one that followeth me shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So we have John the Baptist, water baptism. This is a transition time, Old Testament, New Testament. Luke 16, 16 says, with prophets were until John. So we have John the Baptist having a water baptism uh, for repentance, Prior to Calvary. Okay, on the cross, Matthew 20, verse uh, 22 and 23, you have a death baptism of Jesus Christ where He gets placed into death. What's baptism mean? It means to be placed into something. It could be water. It could be death. It could be a person, Moses, like Him on the Moses. Okay, it could be the Holy Ghost. Okay, so you have the death baptism. This is Matthew 20. Baptism unto death, verse 22 and 23. He's, uh, he said to the apostles, The baptism that I will be baptized with, shall you be baptized. Now, look at that verse. He was baptized by John the Baptist in Matthew 3, but in Matthew 20, he says, I'm going to be baptized. Future tense. Yeah, but he was already baptized. It's obviously a different baptism. And it's the baptism of death. So therefore, when you are baptized into death, you're baptized into Christ, but neither one has anything to do with water. Okay, so Matthew 20 is a baptism unto death. After Calvary, after Calvary, uh, for uh, simplicity's sake, let's use the word, the person's name on this one. You have Peter's water baptism or Acts 2.38. Okay, Acts 2.38, right after Calvary. This is Acts 2.38 that the Catholics hold to, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, the water dogs, all think the way to salvation is through Acts 2.38. Now, this one is similar to John the Baptist. Both are baptism under repentance. One's before Calvary, one's after Calvary. Okay, Acts 2.38. So those are two separate things. This is Jewish water baptism. Okay, after Calvary. Then you have a couple of years later uh, in... We'll put the Ethiopian eunuch right here. Eunuch. Okay, right in here. Where he shows water baptism for a Gentile. Okay, what gave him, uh, why, why did he get baptized in water? Because he believed in Jesus Christ. Okay, so we got Moses, John, Death, Peter, Eunuch. Okay, the one real baptism is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. This is called Baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay, it says in Acts 1.5, you know, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. You read through that. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And what happens there, how this takes place is, For by one Spirit we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. This has nothing to do with water. At the moment a sinner comes to Jesus Christ for his salvation and places his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, the Spirit of God takes this individual and puts him in Jesus Christ, puts Jesus Christ in him, and this is called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost comes in their body. The Holy Ghost is immersed into them permanently. Okay, that is a result of the new birth. It has nothing to do with tongues. It's got nothing to do with that stuff. Okay? It has nothing to do with 
Pentecost in particular, it just happened the first occurrence on the day of Pentecost. All the other Pentecost after that didn't happen. So this is a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now Matthew chapter 3 mentions there's a baptism of fire. The baptism of fire takes place over here after the white throne judgment because at the end of the millennium there's a white throne judgment right here and all the lost people will be thrown into a lake of fire. They get baptized in fire. So you got seven baptisms, seven different time periods. Moses, John, death, Acts 2.38, Acts 8, Acts 10. When you get born again, anybody who gets born again during this church time period is the Holy Ghost. And if they don't get born again, because it said in Matthew 3, John and baptized with water, but Jesus, the one that follows, shall baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Two separate baptisms. This is saved people, that's lost people. Okay, so that's the seven baptisms. Okay, let's try the seven Gospels. Okay, if you would look in 1 Corinthians chapter... Now, no, go Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 and uh, Luke 4. Seven Gospels. Isaiah 61... Okay, verse 2, or verse 1, I do believe it uses the words good tidings or glad tidings. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Uh, we're looking at one phrase, basically, in here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Good tidings. Isaiah 61, 1. Okay, that verse and the second half of verse 2, we're not looking at the doctrine, we already covered this, is read by Jesus in Luke 4. And you'll notice in Luke 4, instead of using the words good tidings, in Luke 4 verse 18, it uses the word gospel. Gospel. So what does gospel mean? It means good tidings. So the word gospel can refer to salvation, but it also can just refer to some good tidings. Some good news. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. We'll do this one first. We won't run chronologically. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 is the gospel that saves today. This is the gospel that the Jehovah Witnesses are supposed to be preaching. But they're not. They're preaching a different gospel. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, I declare unto you, brethren, or we declare unto you, the gospel. What is it defined? Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay, in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. Everyone I believe to the Jew first and also the Greek. Okay, so this we'll call this the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace. Okay, say, we'll put it here, even though God's grace is manifested throughout the entire Bible. So the gospel of grace, that is what a person is to rely upon in this time period for eternal life. Okay, make sure we get that right. Now, there's going to be a fake one of that mentioned in Galatians 1. But we're just looking at the word gospel. Now, if you would look in Galatians chapter 3. Remember the word gospel means good tidings. Galatians 3 verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, and these shall all nations be blessed. 
Notice the good tidings or good news or glad tidings that he preached unto Abraham was not how that Christ died for our sins. Okay? According to Scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day according to Scriptures. Notice that wasn't the good news given to Abraham. The good news to Abraham, the gospel that was given to Abraham was, in these shall all nations be blessed. So here we have Abraham living back here around 2000 B.C. Okay? And so the gospel given to Abraham is, in these shall all nations be blessed. Meaning, all nations in the world get a blessing through Israel or Abraham. That is a national blessing of a land grant that belongs to a nation. That's called a gospel. Okay, on the next one, Hebrews 4, verse 1 through 3. 1, 2, and 3. Hebrews 4. Okay, the Hebrews 4, verse 2. It says, uh, well, verse 1, Let us therefore fear. Okay, stop there. Who's us? You ask yourself two questions. Who, who's talking? To whom is he talking? Let us. The recipients are. Title of the book, Hebrews. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise be left us of entering into his rest. Okay, in this context, if they are in the last days, doctrinally, entering into the rest... That's the millennium. Seventh day on the calendar, seven, or God's calendar. Okay, entering into the rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. There's a chance of losing it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word did preach did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed, do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What's he talking about? Okay, well, around 1500 B.C. in this range, Moses becomes the first national leader. The one that follows Moses and Joshua. Joshua is trying to get the Jews to obey God because he gave them good tidings that if you obey me, you will conquer the land of Canaan and you will enter into my rest if you go into Canaan. That is the parallel of what he's saying in Hebrews that if you conquer here, then you will go into the millennium. My rest. So what is this? This is the gospel of of military conquest. This is the gospel unto Israel stating that if you obey me, you will conquer those people in Canaan. You get the land. That's good news about a military conquest. Okay, what's the gospel Jesus Christ preached? Matthew chapter 4. This is the gospel that JWs pretend to preach when they come to your house. Matthew 4. What did Jesus Christ preach during His three and a half year ministry right at this time prior to Calvary? And it is the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom right there. The good news, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is coming. Matthew 4.23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then so forth. Now, if, there, if the JW is going to preach the gospel of the kingdom, then he better back it up with healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 4.23. Now, interesting thing about this gospel of the kingdom is if you would look in Matthew 24.14. The gospel of the kingdom is what the Lord preached during this time period. But this gospel of the kingdom shows up again right over there. 
Matthew 24, 14. It says, In this gospel the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end... The end? Well, looky there. That's how I got it over there in the end. See how this book's laid out? And if that's not a good enough clue, verse 15 says the abomination of desolation. Verse 21 says great tribulation. So that's why this gospel of the kingdom takes a skip over here. But you know how God can mess up somebody who wants to mess up their Bible like a JW? He takes this gospel, the JW, and tries to pull it over here. You see, that's how slick the devil is. He's more subtle than any beast of the field. He can't get the JW deceived, maybe on drinking, maybe on smoking, maybe on drugs, maybe on rock music or something else. But he can get him deceived with the Bible. New World Translation. You have the gospel of the kingdom. Now, how do we know these are different? Look in Matthew 26. How do you know there's got to be different Gospels? Look at Matthew 26, verse 13. How many of you ever taken a soul winning class? Okay, how to win a soul to Jesus Christ. Okay. Matthew 26, 13. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this Gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman be, hath done, be told for memorial. Okay, of her. Okay, how many of you that took a soul winning class, in the class, they said, after you give somebody the gospel, then you need to tell them about this lady? Nobody. Obviously, that shows us there's more than one gospel, is there not? What gospel is he talking about in Matthew 26, 13? Is it the death, and resurrection of Christ? Well, the context... You know, you may not know exactly for certain what it is, but a good logical guess would be the gospel of the kingdom. Because that's what Matthew's aiming at. Okay, so we have the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, and next one, the uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 6. Here's another gospel. 1 Peter 4, verse 6. And we should be able to get these seven gospels in. 1 Peter 4, 6. Okay, this says, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Well, what gospel is he talking about preaching to dead people? Verse 5, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Who's preaching the gospel? Here, verse 5 implies Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ doing? Preaching the gospel, some sort of good news, to somebody who's dead. And what is this? Well, if you go back uh, to 1 Peter, let's see, 3, and find out what he did, verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So during the three days and three nights, when the Lord was in the heart of the earth from a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, definitely not on Good Friday, okay, the Lord Jesus, after his death, went down into uh, the heart of the earth, two compartments, and he preached the good news of the resurrection to the dead. He said, hey, we're getting out of here. And then they got out of there. He which ascended first descended in the lower parts of the earth. He went up, preached good news to those people down there. I'm here to pardon you. And three days they got out. That's good news. Okay, so that's the gospel of the resurrection. Okay, next one. Romans 2, verse 16. Romans 2, verse 16. Okay, Romans 2.16, Paul says this, uh, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. My gospel. 
Is he talking about the gospel of Christ? No, he says my gospel. So, uh, let's see if we can find something else to help us out to try to figure that one out. He, uh, Romans 16 at the end of the book. 16.25. And this one seems to give us a better definition of what he means by my gospel. Romans 16.25. Now to him that is of power to establish you, establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Notice, my gospel is separated from the preaching of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known unto all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. What gospel is he talking about? This would be the sound doctrine that establishes a born-again believer in the Scriptures. My Gospel. This is Paul's writings. See, what Paul was given was kept secret since the foundation of the world. What did he show Paul? You read it all in Romans. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 2 Thessalonians, 1 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Those are 13 letters that are written to the body of Jesus Christ called my gospel. Paul's gospel. Okay, last one. Uh, last one. Revelation chapter 14. Now, we're not a hyper dispensationist and say, oh, you should limit yourself only to Paul. No, you study all the Bible, but you understand that Paul is your standard. Romans 14. I heard an evangelist several years ago 